can be seated. Well, as we begin our, our second week in our new series, Encounters with Christ, we, we run into a question. And it's a question I think that we can kind of run into in our Christian life all the time, and that's, that's what kind of people does God choose to use? What, what kind of people does God choose to use? I mean, what do you think, does God choose the most upright and the most honest and deserving people to experience his grace? I mean, just when it comes to his grace, is he looking for the best people out there? Does he choose the most educated, the most intelligent and erudite to spearhead his kingdom work in the world? The people that are doing the most work for his kingdom, are they the sharpest tools in the box? Does he choose the most articulate, fascinating, and compelling people to declare his forgiveness and reconciliation through faith in Christ? Is that who he looks for? It's an important question to ask. It's an important question for us to ask as Christians because it's easy for us to overlook and ignore the very kind of people that Jesus chose as his very first disciples. Isn't it? I mean, even more, it's easy for us to excuse ourselves from important aspects of our discipleship to Jesus Christ because we're convinced that he could never use us in his service. I mean, it's easy to look at like, the YouTube videos of these, these great communicators and great pastors who reach, who reach hundreds of thousands of people and be like, I could never do anything for Jesus. Look at what these guys are doing. On top of that, maybe we have a past that we're not so proud of. Maybe we have some hangups in the present that we're still trying to work through. Maybe for all the time that we've been a Christian, if we're honest, we really still don't know our Bible very well. Maybe we just look at our lives and say, I don't know that God would use me because I'm just a normal person with a normal everyday job. And on top of that, I'm just busy. I'm a busy person. I mean, I don't don't know where I'd fit that into my schedule. So between our busyness and our unimportance and maybe our sense of shame, we think that we are somebody that God would never use. but we go to Luke chapter five today and we see the kind of people that Jesus starts with. He starts with with Peter, James, and John, just just ordinary dudes. They got their own sinful hangups, they got their own issues in life. My gosh, we see it as we read through the gospels. But it's where Jesus starts. Blue collar guys who are just focused on their careers, focused on just making a living for their families, paying the rent, getting food. They're they're not thinking big, important things in life. They're not looking out at God's kingdom work. They're really just looking out to the next night to set their nets again. And in this, Luke wants us to see that when Jesus comes on the scene, he doesn't just offer sinners forgiveness. He doesn't just offer sinners forgiveness. No, he recruits them to reach other sinners. Yes, he offers forgiveness, but he recruits sinners to bring other sinners to faith in Jesus Christ as well. So let's turn to our text today. Luke chapter five, starting in verse one. On one occasion... While the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that is the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. Now as we go to the the story this morning, I'm pretty sure that if you've been in the church any length of time, you already know the story. 
If you grew up in the church, you've heard it a number of times in children's church. And, and even, even people who are like outside the church, didn't grow up in the church, many of them have heard this story as well. So like this isn't a new story that we come to today. Not a new account. But how many of you are aware of the fact that Simon, Peter, and Jesus already know each other when this happens? Did you know that? Luke chapter four, same book. Luke chapter four, starting in verse 38. Speaking of Jesus, and he rose and he left the synagogue and he entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever and it left her and immediately she rose and she began to serve him. Jesus, Jesus has already been to Simon's house. He's already healed Simon's mother-in-law and most likely it happened at Simon's request. In fact, this previous interaction helps us grasp why Simon, a fisherman, would so quickly give in to Jesus' request for a little boat ride after a long, hard night of fishing with no fish in the nets and fish nets to be cleaned. I can tell you, there is not much more of a grumpy person to be around than a commercial fisherman who has caught nothing. Backhaul is not fun. It's tedious, it's laborious, and when you have nothing to show for it, it is frustrating. Yet Simon says yes, and this helps us see that Jesus, Jesus here isn't just stumbling on a random group of fishermen when, when he goes out teaching that morning by the side of the lake. No, no, as we're gonna see, Really, really what's happening here is Jesus has been fishing for Simon before this account ever began. Jesus has been on a fishing expedition of his own long before he stepped in Simon's boat. In fact, we see this emphasized as we're gonna read through this dialogue this morning because Luke doesn't bother telling us what Jesus taught. Notice, he doesn't say, not a thing about the kingdom, not a thing about the gospel. All of the dialogue in this passage is between Peter and Jesus. That's it. But this fact really doesn't come to clarity that Jesus and Peter are the center of the story until the carpenter tells the commercial fisherman what to do. In fact, in the original Greek, Jesus gives a command. I mean, I mean just, just, just think about it. He's giving a command. Verse four, when they had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and we took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. See, see Jesus isn't asking Simon for permission. He's not saying, hey, let's just go try another time. Let's just see what, let's, let's just try it one more time. That's not what he's saying. In the Greek, it's an imperative. He's giving Simon instructions, the pilot of the boat, it's time to head out. And the second imperative is actually to the crew, it's in the plural, put down the nets. You guys, put down the nets. I mean, Jesus has just taken charge of the fishing expedition. He's issuing crews to both Simon and his crew. Now let me just tell you, I mean, I, I lived in a commercial fishing port for 18 years. Kodiak, Alaska, large fishing port, interacted with tons of fishermen and captains. And, and I can tell you that the captains rule, rule their ships with an iron fist. They don't let anything go. And there's probably no quicker way for, for a landlubber or greenhorn to get thrown off a boat than to tell a captain or his crew what to do. I mean, I mean there were stories. I mean, these aren't just like made up stories. They actually happened. There would be times that you'd hear of people that got left at the most remote cannery. Like captains would just put them off their ship. They'd stop into port, they'd offload their haul, they'd offload a crew member they didn't want anymore, and be like, find your way home. 
They ain't back to sea. I mean, that, that's normal stuff that could happen. Yet Peter gets direct commands from Jesus. And the worst thing is, is he tells him something to do that everybody knows is an absolute waste of time. Jesus' command is utter nonsense. Let's go out and fish. What, what's the problem? The, the, the problem in this text is, is that they fished at night for a reason. Did you notice in the text? They fished all night and they caught nothing. Why do they fish at night? Because the fish only come up from deep water into shallower water at night, number one. And number two, especially when it comes to first century nets, they could see the nets in the daylight. Fish aren't blind. They're not, they're not absolutely dumb. If they see a net, they're gonna turn and go the other way. I mean, even the modern nets that we use, many of the modern nets still to a degree can be seen in the right light. They're still working to try to make the invisible net when it comes to gill netting fish. So I can only imagine that at this moment here when Simon gets this, it's ridiculous. His crew knows it's ridiculous. And, and that Simon is like in the moment, like his ears are turning red, and he's mixing, he has this mix of anger and confusion and embarrassment and obligation. All of these things are coming together because on one hand, he knows it's stupid, and he's just been told what to do in front of his crew, and here's the man who healed his stepmom. Which is why I think that Simon responds in such a balanced manner. When we get to his response, Master, we toiled all night and we took nothing. I think, I think he's giving the best, the best turn of a phrase he can give in the moment. Master, we worked all night, we took nothing. But then we get the second half. But at your word, at your word, I will put down the nets. And it's really, really at this point of the account that we, we start to hear two voices in Simon's reply. They're both his. Two voices in Simon's reply. One is the voice of the professional commercial fisherman and the other voice is that of the fledgling disciple. Two voices. Yeah, Simon knows. He knows from experience the futility of fishing, at, fishing after sunup. And he reminds Jesus about it. Sun's up. The time for fishing is over. What do we do at this time of day? After we're done with our nets, we go home and we take a nap. That's what we do now. We're exhausted. We just want to go home. But on the other hand, Simon's final word isn't actually anchored in his years as a commercial fisherman. It, it actually has nothing to do with his commercial fishing experience at all. He knows it is a worthless endeavor. But on the authority of Jesus, who at this moment, he appears to be trusting more than he trusts his years of experience. And that for Simon, as it is for believers of all time, is what the Bible calls faith. That's what we see in Simon's answer. We see faith. Now, now is this a perfect, full-orbed faith? Oh, no. No, it's a, it's a crumpled, wrinkly, imperfect, partial faith, but it's there. There is faith in Peter's voice. And what is this thing that we call faith? We, we go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. I want, I want you to see that because I think we have a lot of difficulty defining what we mean by faith. Faith is not a blind leap into the unknown darkness. That is not faith. It's not a blind leap. Faith is not built on fairy tale wishes. Faith is not some foolish hope that we've invented in our own minds and we just think it sounds good. No, according to the writer of Hebrews, faith is a reasonable decision. 
It's a reasonable decision to act out of deep-seated confidence with hope that this unseen promise is both trustworthy and true. Remember, back, back to Hebrews. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's assurance. It's a conviction of things not seen. And, and as we read through God's word, it's, it's always built on those things that God has already done. That's why it's reasonable. That's why there can be assurance. That's why there can be a conviction is because we've already seen the things that God has done. He's proved himself to be trustworthy. Therefore, he will be trustworthy again. And has Jesus already done something that Peter has seen? And the answer is yes. Has it been fish? No. So this helps us see that when Peter agrees to let Jesus give the orders, he's not just being passive, he's not just simply trying to humor Jesus, he's actually trusting that Jesus' plan is going to produce some kind of catch. Now what kind of catch Peter's expecting, I don't know. Maybe we're gonna catch three fish, the blind ones, right? What we'll catch the dumb ones? He doesn't expect the kind of catch that they get. He gets a catch he never bargained for, verse six. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. That's significant. They singled the other partners and the other boat came out to help them and they filled up both the boats so that they began to sink. Now, now you got the catch, you got the nets are breaking, the fish they're getting in out of the breaking nets are sinking the boats that are putting the catch in. Peter definitely got more than he bargained for. You know, and I, I, I can be honest, like, I, I mean, I can understand this adrenaline and excitement of Peter and their crew. I mean, I mean, anybody who's ever just gone fishing, rod and reel, knows how exciting it is to have that tip just bend over, the drag to be screaming, but it's an entirely different issue when you have nets out. They explode when the fish hit them, water splashing all over, the nets bouncing up and down. It's amazing. It's a treat that few people get if they haven't been out fishing like that. We, we actually had, I mean, I, went, I was a commercial fisherman for three months in my early 20s. It's, it's definitely a young man's game. But I was out there and we, we, had, we had one catch. We had, this, we had a really large catch and it wasn't miraculous. But we brought in, we had five ton of fish come in in one net. I mean, it was so full. We had two panel nets that were sewed together. We were having to cut between the panels to get the fish into our boat. And then at the end, it took me three hours to shovel them down the hold, knee deep on a 54 foot fishing vessel in fish. Amazing, so, so like, like, I mean, I can kind of see this just a little bit. So there's excitement. I can understand the excitement. It makes absolute sense, but what doesn't make sense in this text is how Peter responds to the catch. Peter's response doesn't fit the environment. Thank you, Jesus. This is awesome, Jesus. Jesus, can you get us to shore? <laughs> right? But no, how does he respond? Verse eight, but when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinner, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. What's interesting here is that it's for everything that Luke is telling us here in the text is that Simon's reaction to the catch is immediate. This isn't later on when they're on shore. This isn't the next day later. This is when they're out. The nets are breaking, the boats are sinking, and what's, what's Simon doing? He's saying, get away from me. I'm a sinner. See, see, in Peter's mind, he recognizes something more than he'd seen before in Jesus. He recognizes that Jesus is in some way God's chosen agent. Because, not only, because only God could cause such a miracle to occur. 
See, for a man who knows his business, he, this, 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 is, this is a miracle. There is no way this can happen. There is no way apart from God causing it to happen that this would happen. And in light of this revelation, in light of the catch and the chaos and the danger, all of those things that Peter is experiencing in the moment, they just vanish. It's like Peter doesn't see all the water rolling into the boat. He doesn't see that it's breaking. He has one thought on his mind, and that is where do I stand with Jesus? I was reading this week on this passage, and I, I love what Tim Keller had to, to say about this. He said, what we learn from this passage is, is that when people experience Jesus Christ for the first time, they truly experience him. They experience what, what we might call a self-quake. You know, it's like an earthquake, except it's not, it's not the earth that's in upheaval, it's actually our identity. When we really see Jesus, everything on the inside, so how we see ourselves, starts to just unravel and come apart. I mean, on the one hand, we can think about it in everyday life. We've had the experience, we're at work, and maybe, maybe we've just thought like we're a person who's really smart or really competent at our job, we're doing all of our things, and then some new person comes in, we're assigned to work with them and find out that they exceed our knowledge and experience by light years. And, and it, can be, it can be frustrating, it can be aggravating, it can be embarrassing. I mean, that, that, that kind of thing can happen, but, but on the other hand, what happens, and we do this as humans, we can be honest, we build our identity around something. We build the value of our humanness and our presence on this earth in something. We build our value into it, and for some, it's, it, it's, it's, in their, it's in their sense of intelligence. I'm just a smarter person. For, for other people, it, 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 it might be something else. It might be their proficiency at work. Athletic ability. Just, just personal appearance. For some it could be their view that they're a rock star homeschool mom. Like, like, there's, like there's any number of different places we can go to build our identity. But what happens when it falls apart? Well, for a person who's built the entire foundation of their life around the belief that they're an inherently a good person, who does good moral things most of the time. What happens when that kind of person truly gets a glimpse at God? What happens when they see Jesus for who he truly is? If, you're, if your entire world or a major part of your identity is built on the fact that I'm okay, I do good stuff, I'm way better than everybody else around me, I'm a pretty religious person, I go to church at least twice a month. I mean, I mean, it's only like those extreme people that make it more than two. I do most of the stuff in the Bible that I can remember. What happens when we really begin to see Jesus as he is? Are we overwhelmed with this peaceful, easy feeling? Do we get feel like we get just wrapped up in a big, warm, snuggly blanket? The biblical answer is no. No, when we, when we, when we, when we, when we start to see God for who he truly is, we are undone. We fall apart because we recognize things about ourselves that we never saw before because now they're not in comparison to the people around us, but they're in comparison to God. We start to see our unholiness. We start to see our sin. We start to see our failure. Just think about Isaiah, Isaiah chapter six. Gets his glorious vision of God on his throne. 
He's not singing, open the eyes of my heart. He sees God on the throne. He falls apart. What does he cry out? Woe, woe is me. I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He sees God and all he can see is his, his deserving of punishment. How about Job? Job at the very end of the book. When he gets near to God, what does Job say? I heard of you with my ears. Like, like I heard, but now I see. I see you with my eyes, and I repent. I despise myself. I repent in dust and ashes. He gets a true vision for the glory and the holiness of God, and he comes apart. And this is why Peter cries out. This is why Peter cries out, depart from me, for I am a man, a sinful man, O Lord. He recognizes that God was actively working in the ministry of Jesus. He's not just captivated by the miracle, which is most of the people in Jesus' ministry life. They're looking at the miracles. They want to see great things done. They're seeing the miracle. He doesn't see the miracle. He sees the God who's performing the miracle. And seeing God's work causes him to see his sin in a completely new light. His religion isn't enough to bear up under the weight. Whatever degree of religion Peter has. So he comes into contact with Jesus, he sees him as he is, and in his self-quake, two things happen. Number one, his identity disintegrates. He sees himself in the light of God's holiness. He's recognizes, he recognizes probably for the first time in his life that he is not a good person who occasionally falls into sin. I mean, that's how we like to see ourselves. I'm a relatively good person, I occasionally mess up. No, for the first time in his life, he realizes he deserves God's wrath. That's what he recognizes. He's a self-centered man whose best deeds are tainted with and driven by his sinful self-interest. I mean, that's how the Bible talks about us, apart from Christ. We can go all the way back to Isaiah 64, 6. We've all become like one who's unclean. All of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment, or as the old King James would say, filthy rags. Why why, why would our most righteous deeds be like filthy rags? It's because even when we're doing righteous things in our sin, they're they're still formed and informed by our sin. Number two. The second thing that happens to Peter is not something that Peter does, but what Jesus does. Jesus forever transforms Peter's identity by the mercy and the grace of God. We see that in in, in that Simon's confession of sin. This is important. Simon's confession of sin doesn't prove to be a barrier with his relationship with Jesus Christ. You think of anything that would be a barrier between somebody and God would be saying, I'm a sinner. But rather, Peter's confession, just like with the prophet Isaiah, functions as the very foundation of his new identity and his commission to service. The confession leads to a commission. Let's go back to Isaiah first. After Isaiah made his confession, I'm a man of unclean lips, verse six, then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. But it doesn't stop there. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. The confession of sin opens the door to be used by God because in it God deals with the sin. Luke 5, second half, verse 10. Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. 
from now on you'll be catching men. He's just confessed that he's a sinner, that he shouldn't be by Jesus, and Jesus brings him in and commissions him into service. And when Jesus says catching men here, in the first century, this would have been initially understood as like kidnapping and enslaving people, which is obviously what Jesus does not mean. But rescuing and restoring sinners to a right relationship with God that they might truly live. That, that's, that's, that's the calling that Peter's being brought into. And who's better suited for the task? Who's better suited for the task of reaching sinners with the good news of forgiveness and restoration to God but sinners? Which is who Jesus chooses to use. I mean, I mean it's really interesting here that Jesus is grabbing this group of blue collar dudes out of a fishing boat and what he's not saying is like, you know, I'm really into spiritual work and doing religious things and you guys are a bunch of blue collar guys. Let me help you with your private spiritual lives a little bit, but like I, I, need, I need to go find some like, you know, religious people to help me out. It's not where he goes. And in this case, we can see that Jesus didn't come to drive sinners away from his holy presence, to, but to draw them into the net of his saving grace. He didn't come to drive sinners away but to draw them up into his net of saving grace. John three seventeen, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. He didn't send his son to condemn the world. No. First John 4, 9, And this is the love of God was manifest among us. God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. What, when we weren't loving God, when we didn't care about God, when we were doing our own thing, God sent his son. He didn't look around the world and go, hey look, there's enough people who are looking for me and trying to do the right thing. No, when we were sinners when we were enemies, Christ died for us. So how does Simon and his crew respond? Do they ask for a couple weeks to think about it? I mean, most of us when we get a job offer, we're like, you know, let me sleep on it. Give me a couple days, give me a week or two. Verse 11, they left, and when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything. They left everything and followed him. Now we can kind of think like, like what does Luke mean by they, 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 like they left everything and followed him? I mean, did they liquidate all their assets? I, I, I don't think so. I mean, some of these men have families. Just think about it. Peter has a mother-in-law, which means most likely he has a wife. When they left everything, I think, I, think, I think Luke's just simply saying this. They left their entire old life behind. They left their old life behind. They left their boats behind. They left their nets behind. They left their homes behind. They left their tools behind. And most likely, they probably left the money from their catch behind too. I'm, I'm pretty sure when they left everything behind, they didn't haul the boats up on shore with the fish in them and leave them to rot in the sun. I'm pretty sure they sold them. They got bills, they got family, they got responsibilities. But they left their old life and they turned and followed Jesus. And that's because their new priority in life was no longer fishing for profit, but fishing for people. Fishing for people who would become faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. It's a new calling kind of people that God chooses to use. So, so let's, 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 let's touch on two implications. Two implications of this account for our everyday discipleship to Jesus Christ. No, number one, 
Number one, as we look at Peter's response in the boat to Jesus, we gotta recognize that repentance and faith are the very first steps of Christian discipleship. How do we come to faith in Christ? How do we become a Christian? It happens through repentance and faith. It's impossible to be a disciple of Jesus unless we've seen ourselves as we truly are in all of our sin. Why, 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 why do so many people in the world not recognize their need for forgiveness and their need for Jesus? They don't see their sin as it really is in the eyes of a holy God. They don't see the cost of what that sin really entails. There, there's no present benefit. Why would I want to go do all that stuff and change all my life? They just don't see their sin as it really is. The only way we can see ourselves as we really are is when God reveals himself through the gospel and we see for the first time the gravity, the ugliness of our sins and the beautiful glory of Jesus Christ. The good news of the gospel always begins with the bad news. The good news doesn't make sense apart from the bad news. The bad news being that apart from faith in Christ, apart from forgiveness, we are doomed to eternal punishment. That's the bad news. But but see, the good news of the gospel is we we don't need to run away from Jesus when we see our sin, when we finally grasp it for the weight and the ugliness and everything that it entails. We don't have to run away from Jesus. That's what Peter thought. He thought he needed to get away from Jesus. But that was the answer to his problem. But the problem, the the solution isn't getting away from Jesus. And sometimes we can feel the same way. Maybe you felt that way earlier in your life if you're a Christian now. And if you're not a Christian yet, maybe you could even feel that way. Like, like, I I don't feel closeness. All I feel is ugliness when I hear of Jesus. All I fear, I feel is weight and guilt. When we finally see how sinful we are, it's only natural for us to feel that we don't deserve God's presence. It's only right for us to feel like we don't deserve anything. It's because we don't deserve anything. That's the whole whole thing about grace. Grace is undeserved. Grace is free. Grace is God's work for us. But we constantly feel like we're too guilty to be where God is. Yet this is exactly why Jesus came. He came to bring us close to God by dying on the cross for our sins. Not not merely to give us new instructions on how to live a life. He certainly gave many things for us to learn and to, to, to be taught but apart from coming to faith in him and receiving forgiveness, those things don't lead anywhere. Our sinful, guilty hearts are always wanting to push Jesus away, but rather than pushing him away, he calls us, he calls us to come to him in repentance and faith so that we might receive forgiveness. The promise that he constantly holds out So what I want you to see in this is that Jesus never leaves a sinner who truly repents. When Jesus replied, don't be afraid, he was telling Simon, he was telling Simon, your sins do not disqualify you from a right relationship with me and they do not disqualify you from being able to serve God. Second thing, second thing we see in this text this morning is that evangelism is a fundamental component of our Christian discipleship. I mean, I think we all know that. You know, you know it's been said, we've, we've, we've heard the saying out there, I don't even know when it first came out, give a man a fish, you can feed him for a day, teach a man a fish, you feed him for a lifetime, right? But what Jesus is showing us here is that that if you teach a man to fish for men, the people he catches will live forever. Fishing for men is important. 
And, and, and Peter, as we follow him in his life, we go through the Gospels, and he's got some rough points. He's got some places he kind of craters out. We're wondering if he's ever going to come back out of him. And yet we get into Acts. We get to the day of Pentecost, the very first sermon preached. Peter's fishing, and he hauls in boatloads of believers. 3,000 people come to faith to Jesus Christ in a single sermon. He's doing exactly what Jesus called him to be and to do. And the New Testament's clear that this calling is not just for apostles like Peter. Now, evangelism is an ordinary part of our everyday discipleship. Ordinary part. Everyone who follows Jesus is called to be a fisherman. In fact, if you think about it, evangelism is a lot like fishing. When you go out, you never know what you're going to catch or if you're going to catch anything. I mean, I did a lot of fishing, just just sport fishing in Kodiak. We had multiple trips, zero. Nothing in the cooler to take home. And then you go out the next time, and, and you got the boat loaded with fish. You never know what you're going to catch. Evangelism is the same way. I mean, just, just I mean, like, like avid fishermen do not stop fishing after their third trip of not catching fish. They think through everything they were doing. They look at their tackle. They do all sorts of things, planning out, replanning where they're going to go. But they're going to catch some fish. But if a fisherman refuses to fish, we all know what the result is going to be. The fisherman that doesn't fish doesn't catch any fish, ever. The same thing is true when it comes to our evangelism as Christians. We won't see any results if we're not active. In fact, it might be helpful to kind of think of evangelism maybe more in terms of nets than hooks. And again, I know that we're not familiar with net fishing down here in lower 48 because, I mean, it's hooks and barbless hooks and all these crazy rules in Washington that you gotta abide by. But like, like I mean, net, net fishing, just kind of think of nets. I mean, think we've got a category. You've watched a couple videos online or maybe watched, maybe watched some fishing shows on TV. But just think about it. We, we think of it in terms of nets. I mean, inviting friends to small group and Sunday worship. Speaking to family members about spiritual things, testifying to God's goodness in our day, daily lives, just sharing, sharing the gospel any way we can. We're just, we're just putting the nets out various ways. It can look different ways. It's not always trying to pin somebody in a corner and get them to either make a confession to Jesus Christ or to not. And we gotta know, and I think we do know, all of our efforts will not be successful, just like they're not always successful when we go fishing but it's never a reason to stop fishing. We should never, ever, ever allow our our ineffectiveness or our unproductiveness in, in evangelism to prevent us from doing the very thing that God has commanded us to do. In the same way that a fisherman keeps casting his nets, we are called to keep sharing our faith in faith. because we have the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, that God is active and at work when his gospel is being proclaimed. And that when it comes down to it, our perfection, our delivery, isn't going to be the ultimate reason why somebody comes to faith, but it's going to be part of the reason that they do come to faith. What God requires is our witness. It's his business, and it's our business to be fishers of men. And as we cast our nets, what are we looking? We're looking looking to God and God alone for success to see what we will catch by his sovereign grace. That is our calling in life. Jesus just doesn't offer us forgiveness as sinners. He calls us to be active in reaching other sinners as well. Let's close in a word of prayer.